so I'd like to begin. And I, I just want to sure. begin and, and give an overview of, of my thoughts of Chile um, mm -hmm. a little bit. And, and then uh, Brooke will take it from there and I'll, I'll sit in my lounge chair and, and uh, listen to you guys talk. Uh, but, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel many places uh, related to wine. Um, a lot of the old world, you know, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, of course, uh, to taste and learn about wine. Uh, but it wasn't until I had an opportunity, I want to say 15 years ago is the first time I went to a trip to Chile and then uh, about four years ago that I realized um, what, a, what a, an amazing uh, geographic place that Chile is. That First off, it's, it's from a extremely cold climate and to a very warm climate and that you have this little tiny mountain range uh, that buffers so that in the dry season you get no rain but you have unlimited water uh, from the Andes and that allows you to irrigate when necessary. Um, had some of the best fish dinners I've ever had in my life but I also had some great beef. I learned that Carmenere can stand up on its own and is a way cool grape. I also, how many grapes are there active, you know, active grapes? I've tasted uh, peak pool, right? Uh, no, is it peak pool? There were a couple of grapes that I tasted that I, I had never had. Um, but but anyway, the, the, the point is it's Maybe not Maybe Pais. Say again? Pais? Yes, Pais. Uh, I, you know, it's not just Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon Blanc. That there's a world, there's a world down under that is unbelievable, um, and it's exciting and unlimited opportunity, and you can get great, great wines at reasonable price points. So, Brooke, would you like to take it from here? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Gary Fish. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Brooke Sobel. I'm the wine director of Gary's Wine and Marketplace, and welcome to Wines of Chile. Um, and we have the absolute pleasure of having Sofia Araya with us. She is the head winemaker of Veramonte. And Sofia, what's going on in Chile right now? We are right now in the middle of harvest. So busy, busy time. Yeah. Fan <laughs> fantastic. So what's going on right now in terms of harvest and um, I know Chile is dedicated to um, their sustainability. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. So, um, well, I'll, I'll just uh, make a small introduction of myself. So Sofia Araya, head winemaker of Viñedos Veramonte. And uh, we have uh, uh, four brands, which we are going to taste one of them, which is Veramonte. And uh, yes, we have, right now we're in the middle of harvest and we particularly work uh, with a very um, specific philosophy, which is organic, sustainable, but mostly uh, engaged to organic management. So uh, it requires certain uh, certain type of work, I will say, that I will explain to you briefly today. So, but in terms of harvest or uh, uh, picking point or quality uh, is just as uh, challenging as any other kind of management. In me, in me, and in some points, it, it's even even more challenging. Mm -hmm. So you want me to take it from here? Absolutely. Yes, okay, thank you, Brooke. So, well, I have a small presentation that I wanna share with you. Um, let me see. Please let me know if you if everything is okay and you and if you can see it, uh, it's, it's share here. Can you see it? Not yet. Yep. There we go. All right. So well, this is actually a picture of our estate in Casablanca. Uh, I will explain to you just a bit of what our estates. Um, are and where they are located. But this is Vignedos Veramonte, which as I told you, holds four different brands, which is Veramonte, Ritual, Primus, and Neyen. Today, we will be tasting our Veramonte Sauvignon Blanc 2020. So this is a, a 
briefly to talk to you a little bit as Gary was telling you as, as he was uh, explaining a little bit about the geography we have a long thin country sort of like an spaghetti it's over I'm sorry I speak in kilometers not in miles but uh, you can do maybe the the transformation uh, it's a, over 4,000 kilometers long and um, it goes from the desert, the driest desert in the world, which is the Atacama Desert, to even the Antarctic continent. So it goes from really hot to uh, very, very rainy, cold, and then uh, almost um, uh, uh, sort of like a cold desert, you know, when it's very windy and dry uh, on the south part of the country. So all along we have the Andes Mountains, which is a thin um, but very steep chain of mountains, which uh, sort of um, makes a, 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 an effect on the on the climate and on the weather. But there's also another chain of mountains that goes along from north south, which is called the coastal range of mountains. And that particularly in the case of our states, it's a very important factor to keep in mind because it's not as steep as the Andes Mountains, it's much older, so it's uh, less high and with less uh, slopes, like dramatic slopes. It's softer in, in, in the geography and on, on, on the structure, but it, it still has a height enough to block the Pacific Ocean influence from coming into the continent. So we have the Humboldt Current, which is a very cold, uh, current that comes from the Antarctic continent up to the north. So that decreases the temperature of the sea. And that is the cold influence that we have coming into the continent. So it's like a big conditioner that we have. But whatever land is on the eastern side of the coastal range of mountains, it will be warmer, such Santiago. Santiago is located in that area. So the Maipo Valley uh, is warmer and is more suitable for varieties such as Cabernet Sauvignon and some other reds. Uh, but whatever land is on the western side of the uh, coastal range, such as Casablanca, it's more suitable for white, pinot, and some reds that have a short uh, ripening period, uh, such as Sauvignon Blanc that we're tasting today, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and some others. Uh, Casablanca is uh, the valley that we have our main estate. We have uh, just over 400 hectares. So I believe it's twice as much as in, in acres. Can I ask um, you a question? Can I, yes. Can I ask you a question? Thank you. Since we're, I am getting so thirsty listening about Casablanca and Sauvignon Blanc, can you, can we, can people taste it? Yes, of course. Okay. Please go so ahead. Why don't you tell them about the Sauvignon Blanc and then you can finish the presentation. Yes. Uh, while I talk, we can, uh, we can taste our wine so that you can also locate uh, the geography of it and then the taste of it. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc that we have, it's, uh, I will say it's a more complex kind of style that you may find in some other uh, wineries or some other uh, projects within Casablanca, but mainly if you go uh, closer to the ocean uh, to, for example, other valleys like Leida or San Antonio, which is a much a fresher or let's say greener kind of style. We are, our estate is located in just the beginning of the Casablanca state. So um, it's a warmer spot within the, the region. And we decided at some point that we wanted to reach a, maybe a riper style, focusing a lot on the mouth feeling more than the aromatics and the expression of it or the intensity of it. Uh, we were in a, we wanted and we look for layers in the aromatic uh, uh, expression more than intensity of it and the mouth is one of the things that we really really want to work so you will find a wine that is um, uh, it's, it's, it's rich in the mouth and also uh, we didn't want those uh, those acidities that will let you like almost like hurt on the back of your tongue so we wanted something fresh more balanced and that's the kind of style that we are pursuing in our Casablanca state for our Sauvignon Blanc. Um, we have another two states in the Colchagua Valley. If you ever go through some other of, of our uh, Veramonte wines, you can uh, 
you can uh, see that it's under the Colchagua, so like Cabernet or Carmenere. But today we're focusing on the Sauvignon Blanc. So just um, a touch of the organic management that we do. These are some of these are actually the main aspects that we have to keep in mind in the, um, in the production of organic wine. So fertility, for example, uh, we will compost everything, every organic uh, residue that we have from the wine making itself, we will go to the compost. So all the stems, the seeds, the skins, uh, everything goes into the compost. And also we have uh, grasses growing uh, that we seed it, such as, um, um, oat, I believe is the, is the translation of it. And then also the manure from the, our animals. So we all that produce our own compost and that is the main source of fertility. No uh, uh, inorganic uh, fertilization is, uh, is, um, is done. So the fertility is one of the main aspects and we want to fertilize the soil, not the vine, which is a very, very important difference to keep in mind. Diseases so, Sophia, do you plant certain, um, like, legumes or certain things in between the rows um, to help build up the nutrition of the soil? We used to. Uh, it was the first step when we started changing tours from conventional to organic. We needed to make a quick change. So we wanted to fertilize and bring back the structure and the the biodiversity and sort of the health condition back to the soil quickly. So we started seeding legumes, for example, that will fix nitrogen naturally. Although within time, we have found that is no longer needed. We just leave the natural grasses growing and with the compost additions, uh, there's no need to keep seeding the soil because that requires also to break the soil, to incorporate the, the, the seeding that you did. So what we wanted to reach was a point of balance where you don't need to break the soil anymore. So we don't have to keep breaking the structure that we are hard, so hard working to get back. So now the soil is back into its natural structure and the grasses that naturally grow there that we uh, control just by cutting um, as they dry out because it's an annual grass, uh, they will leave a a pore that will increase the level of oxygen in our soils and then uh, also keeps the structure and keeps the fertility and it's no competition for the vines because the vines also have gone deeper down the soil and we are talking that these grasses grow only on the first few uh, inches of soil so that is a different kind of concept but we used to we used to at the uh, i will say the first four years We've been working organically since 2012 now. So uh, there's a certain balance that we have gained back, uh, fortunately. So uh, diseases is a matter of being always ahead. You have to be preventive, not reactive when you work this way. So you have to always be looking at your vines, seeing if there's a certain symptom to be paying attention to. So everything is going just a step um, ahead of everything, but there's a lot of um, uh, mechanical work that we do because fortunately enough, as Gary mentioned, we have a long dry season, which is uh, the characterized, uh, characteristic of the Mediterranean weather. So we have over the ripening season, no rain. So we have a very good health condition and a very good weather condition for organic production. So diseases are actually uh, not a big deal uh, we do take some measures for botrytis, which is pretty much taking leaves out and having tunnels that allow air flow between the bunches and the, the leaves. Uh, most, most, that's most of the work that we do. Pest control, uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, natural enemies. We have, um, uh, besides the, the natural uh, Grow, um, use like grasses. owls or like uh, birds to help combat the pests? Th that is something that is naturally, naturally comes back. Not that we have decided to put it there, but they start coming back. Uh, but we have a, what, what is called um, a biologic 
corredores biológicos, like a biological corridor, I will say. That's the literal translation. Um, so basically what it is, it's like a sort of a hallway of a forest, of the native forest, of the natural forest that uh, puts or gets together uh, different areas so that allows animals, small animals, small roedores and, and, and insects to flow within inside of the vineyard. So that uh, increases the level of natural enemies and, uh, and also uh, uh, hunters, birds, you will see that um, uh, are bringing back a balance. So there's actually hardly any pest that we have to really worry about. So um, usually you, you can, we, can, you, we can use chickens to help some of the pests uh, for the burrito that we call, which is a, a, a small uh, collapter that eats the fresh shoot grow, but not, not that I will say that we have a lot of issues with pest control anyway, so good thing. Uh, while with control, as I told you, we just cut it. We, I actually like to say uh, like the good weed because there's there's no we we make peace with it in the sense that it's no competition there's no need to worry it's just a, a natural um, uh, state of the of the of the soil and it's a good thing to have because it helps to bring back the structure so there's only mechanical work done with it and husbandry helps us also to the weed control uh, they will eat it and also all the manure that we get from the animals, we will use it for the fertility as that we as we use it for the compost uh, production. So it's a sort of like a circle uh, that we try to keep as close uh, within the, the vineyard as we can. And, and so, us, so you're yes. using also in the cellar, then you, you're using natural yeasts and, and the natural sulfurs and things like that as well? Yes, uh, we do wild fermentations and particularly on the Sauvignon Blanc that you are tasting now, what we do, we have come, walked away from the very reductive kind of um, winemaking. Uh, we actually sort of made peace with oxygen and we do not protect the, 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 the grapes or the juice as much as we used to. We, we let it oxidize a little bit so the wine is very resilient as it has oxidized whatever there is, whatever phenols there are, are there to be oxidized. So we are allowed to use very low amount of sulfur afterwards because there's no need to protect it as much. So after we have gone the pressing process and the uh, cold settling process, the fermentation uh, brings back all the, all the freshness and the fruitiness that we need in the, in the wine. And then basically there's no more other, any other intervention, just blending and bottling. It's a very, very simple wine. And actually all of this management, why do we do it? Because we really feel is the way that we will reach or we, we, we can uh, accomplish uh, the terroir expression through the wines. Uh, there's no, terroir expression, in our opinion, if you have vines that are not connected to the environment and not connected to the terroir itself. So uh, we allow the vines to explore, to understand, to become resilient, to become not so dependent on whatever decisions humans we have to make. Uh, so you can see them uh, reacting in a much better way uh, in harder years. Like example, this particular year was a very hot and warm but you wouldn't see the vines going crazy or turning yellow, the leaves, or uh, going crazy producing sugar. Uh, the wine is still fresh. It has, I, I do think it's, it shows the, 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 the vintage, the 2020 vintage, the characteristics, but it's still fresh and it still has the, um, the acidity, the, the juicy acidity that we like to say. Uh, and. Uh, it's making get... me want to eat. It's making me want to eat some shrimp tacos right now. I mean, my mouth is like salivating and shrimp with some spice. What, what do you like to pair this with? Uh, well, actually, I like to 
talk over the bottle <laughs> because it is a wine that invites you to keep another glass and another glass and you're talking over and all of a sudden oh the bottle is gone <laughs> but and also um fresh salads for example like um goat cheese or uh fresh fresh cheese mozzarella for example uh also goes very well with this one um maybe oysters oh yes we we have a goat cheese that's one of my favorites at the store it's called drunken goat And uh, I have wedges of this in my refrigerator at all times. And this is like a perfect pairing with this. So. Um, and also stir fry veggies came up on the chat as, as a perfect uh, pairing. Who's making that? And when am I coming I think it was over? Tina. I can't, I, it went by too quickly. <laughs> But I like that. I'm, I wrote that term down. Uh, drink over the wine. I love that. <laughs> right. Because that's what it's about. Just sitting with friends. And drinking to the point that you say, oh my goodness, we need to open we another bottle. Well, that's, 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 if, if we can accomplish that, that's a good job done. <laughs> exactly. Yes. What else can you share with us? Well, actually, then I, 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 I didn't want to take much of your time, but I wanted to really transmit to you what we, what our philosophy is about. And and why this wine, it's among all of the Veramonte wines we have, because it's not only the Sauvignon Blanc, but we also have Chardonnay, Pinot, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carmenere, El Rosé. Um, but the Sauvignon Blanc is actually the one that, in my opinion, is the one that represents the best, the terroir and the, and the, the organic work that we do, because it's very honest. Actually, there's minimum intervention at it. At the winery, we pick the grapes, We press, we cold set fermentation, and that's it. There's there's hardly any other job done uh, for this wine because we want it to be that way. We want it to talk about Casablanca, to talk about the, the terroir of our state. So, um, and also being that said, uh, as I was telling you about the sulfur management that is very, uh, a very respectful and, and, and thoughtful use of sulfur. Um, I challenge you, open a bottle of this wine and then leave it at your fridge for, a, I don't know, a week if you want to. You will see, it's, it will still taste fresh and nice. It won't go bad, it won't go oxidated because it's so resilient. I, um, I think it's a great experiment. The odds of anybody <laughs> on this call opening this great bottle of wine and leaving it then for a week is out of the question. <laughs> exactly. But I like the thought. So, so before we move on, I have a vision of having a fresh salad with some goat cheese, then stir fry, and then fish taco, then shrimp tacos. So that's what I'm thinking. That's what my visualization is. Awesome, I'm fish excited. Really good, uh, it's a really good suggestion, a fish taco, yes. Yes. So Sophia, will you stay on while we talk about some of the other wines? Are you, or? Uh, I may stay, yeah, I can stay like a, Five more minutes, maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I will, okay. I will stop sharing my, my screen. Uh, Fantastic. Hey, Brooke, it's all you. Well, Gary Fish, there is no other wine region, wine country on earth where you have desert in the north, ocean to the west, mountains to the east, and Arctic, basically, to the south, right? We, we wore I mean, shorts talk about one diversity. day. And we wore shorts one day, and two days later, we were in the Arctic. Drinking exactly. wine the whole time in both places, by the way. Can I add something, Brooke? Absolutely. It might, be, it, it might be the few places in the world where you can go skiing in the morning and then have dinner by the ocean, early dinner if you want to, by the ocean. <laughs> It's like maybe two hour drive from mountain to ocean. It's, it's just incredible. And the diversity and affordability of these wines, um, Eric Asimov actually just wrote last week about one of yeah. the wines here today, um, that it's a great wine under $10. And so it just shows the that you can get great wine you just have to think a little bit of outside of the box 
And Sophia, one last question before you leave. Talk, so sustainable and, and how, how much of Chile is producing sustainably? I think um, more and more sustainably, I think uh, uh, every project I will say is, is, is becoming really responsible and thinking towards the future. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't dare to say that any winery is not keeping sustainability in their minds. Um, organically, certified organic is different. Uh, there's uh, a whole bunch of us uh, that we are working organically. We are probably uh, the second biggest in, the, in Chile right now. Um, uh, but there's more interest coming uh, with our colleagues and, 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 and some other place from Chile. But uh, okay. I, do, I do believe uh, it's, a, it's a set of mind that we all have in Chile, so yeah. And Lexi Bross, she said it's incredible quality for the price. And this is where, um, and before you got on, Brooke and I were talking about blind tasting versus not. And I prefer to taste seeing the label, knowing the price in advance, because I'm looking at the shelf set, you know. Brooke wants to taste blind, so we don't know anything about the quality. This is a kind of wine. If you taste it blind, you would you would assume it costs double what you're paying for, and that means you could drink over this wine whenever you want. Well, that's great. <laughs> great I love news. that expression. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it my expression, but I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> right, the wine is next. We're gonna jump to Chardonnay. All right. Okay. So. Uh, Brooke and Gary, I, I do have an um, uh, eight month old, so uh, I really, really, really appreciate your invitation. So I'm going to excuse myself. Uh, well, and, thank uh, you for joining us. And congratulations and, on the eight month old. That's a lot oh, of work uh, during hard. Pandemic baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, thank you so thank much. You so much. Yes. And for everyone to enjoy this tasting of Chilean wines. So okay. bye right. bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So some other fun facts about Chile. Um, and everyone can start sipping on the Chardonnay. Um, not only we talk about diversity, but there's volcanoes. Gary Fish, let me ask you a question. How many volcanoes? I didn't study think, for this test. <laughs> how many volcanoes do you think are in Chile? Seven. Hmm. Incorrect. There's 2,900, 500 so of which are active. So talk Which about one. like what that does to the wine, right? It adds a great little smokiness. There's 23 technically different climatic zones. So you have diversity of temperatures, you've got diversity of uh, soils, and the it's long and narrow. And back Elevation. in the... Uh, in elevation, Thank exactly. You. Thank you. Um, the, from they, the Andes. They, yeah, because of the, Andes, the Andes are so high, but as we said, the ocean, you're, you're two, two hours from ocean to Andes and they're growing grapes in the ocean, not in the ocean, but in almost in sand. There are certain vineyards that are virtually in sand and ver certain vineyards are on the side of the Andes. Okay, Brooke, back to you. This area has been there's vines that have been planted here since technically 1548. So it is an incredibly old wine region. We just don't think of it as, as such. Related to that little dictatorship in the middle that threw things behind. So tell us about the Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay. So this comes from Arasuris. This is their Max Chardonnay. Um, and when I first tasted this, I was like blown away just by the aromatics, the spice, um, and there's also a little presence of oak. So let's get into the glass. I didn't bring it into California. <sighs> you didn't pack Sorry. it in your carry-on? No. Mm, kidding. But I've had this wine. Yeah. It's funny because I thought this wine was oaky. Had a, had probably more oak, it, it, it tasted that vanilla caramely oaky thing, but I don't think it is. No, actually they've, re they've cut back on their oak regimen here. Um, and so 
it's bright citrus. You do get some of that, I like to call golden delicious apple, um, that alludes to a little bit more of a riper temperatures. Oh yes, that's a great point. Never been affected by phylloxera. Nope. What is phylloxera? It's a bug. It's a, it's a root eating bug. That That's literally wiped out much of the world's wine population, vine population. Vine. And it has traveled from Bordeaux to California and back. Exactly. Uh, but not to Chile. And that was, a, whoever brought that up, that was a great question. Because that it, it says that the, the, some of these vineyards are very old. Um, and I, I, I tongue in cheek it about the dictatorship, but it really set them back years and years and years. Yes. Okay, so, Chardonnay. So getting into Chardonnay. So Don Urazaris planted vines back in 1870. So we're talking old winery here, old wine region, old winery. And so they had a future to really develop this area. And they planted Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, you have your Cabernet, you also have Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet, um, sorry, Carmenere. Okay. So this Chardonnay, um, it sees about 10 months in French oak barrels. Okay. So, but on the nose, I get that apple. I also get some dehydrated like tangerine peel, some really nice. Yeah, that's what? where Brooke and I separate the conversation. I may get apple, she gets green Macintosh or whatever. I, I, I'm much, I'm a simpler guy when it comes to my descriptions. What are you all getting? Only 25% of this, by the way, is new French oak. That's it, just 25%. And it's reasonably, both of the, they're all actually reasonably priced. Exactly. Cool. The most expensive wine we're actually going to have last, that'll be the Syrah. Right. Anybody have any food tips for the Chardonnay? Oh. Mm. Mm. Lobster, whole bronzino. Jana and I are thinking the same language. She's thinking Chilean sea bass. I'm thinking yeah. whole bronzino. Yeah, but bronzino, don't you have to then debone it? That's too much. I love bronzino, but I want it. I want it clean for me too. I'll eat it, right? I'll do that part. I just need somebody to take the bone. Oh, roast chicken. Roast chicken. Oh, the roast best chicken. roast chicken comes from where? Uh, Suny Cafe, San Francisco. Really? Mm-hmm. I thought Gary's Wine and Market by St. Helena. I'm just going to throw that out there as a selfless plug. <laughs> and I like, I like Al, Al and Lena. They used to come to all of my wine classes uh, when I was a sommelier. Uh, they are probably making grilled octopus and I know where they well, live. So I might be stopping by as I well. like grilled octopus too. Actually, I had grilled octopus the other night at Crest next door to our uh, store. And I didn't get it, but Liz got the chicken. Ridiculously good. But I have a feeling they might have helped use some butter or something. It was just so juicy. So much better than we make chicken at home. Yeah, so a, a question that I'd like to ask everyone is if they didn't like Chardonnay, do they enjoy this one or do they need to have it with food? Because Chardonnay is one of those great varieties that it really can go both ways. And some people like Chardonnay, some people don't. But I'd just be curious. A lot of people like Chardonnay. Exactly. It's a lot of Chardonnay. Well, Chardonnay is just, it's a day drinking. Right. Well, in your it's, case, I mean, you're, now. yes. So anyone want to hop into the reds? Fant Tyler, Chardonnay drinker. He wasn't Chardonnay drinker, but now he enjoys this. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I've liked it. In the, I've liked it in the past. And I did visit um, this winery and it is old. And let me tell you, I did, they put all their money in the grapes and in the um, the, the barrels and stuff because they don't they're not upgrading the facility. It's a big old barn, you know, in essence, which is great. That's what you want. 
That's fantastic. I, well, let's move on to the, we're gonna go cab before Syrah. Why, bro? Because Syrah, especially when you taste this Syrah, it is, well, I'm not gonna. Yeah, whatever like, will be, will be, you know? It's Syrah, Syrah. I love Syrah. Syrah is my favorite grape. So I ha I feel like I have to end with a bang, you know? Okay. Syrah. So Los Vascos. Cab. I've heard of Los Vascos. So Los Vascos. Gary Fish, do you know who is in charge or might be part owner of Los Vascos? Yeah, uh, the Rothschild family. And where are the Rothschild family from? They're actually originally a banking family in France. And the father, or no, it's great grandfather at this point, um, sent his kids all over the world to go into the wine business. So they actually own wineries in Israel, uh, in Chile, I believe in Argentina, in Bordeaux. Do they own anything in Burgundy? Mm, not off the top of my head. But it was, it was a, a cool question. thing where, where, say again? I said, that's a good question. I mean, uh -huh. they, they very well could be. But they're, they're, they're up everything. They're a global winemaking family and everything they do is high quality. Top notch, yeah. yeah. All of these wines, by the way, tonight have are produced at least sustainably, if not organically. So um, they're great, they're clean, they're well-made, great producers, um, classic producers, if you're ever in a testing situation, some of the people that uh, maybe on tonight might be in a testing uh, oh, situation. Yeah, so and if great there's, a test, there's a good chance I'll fail the test. I'm counting on you WSET people on level three that you would pass these tests. And we <laughs> taste so much wine in Napa. If you're studying for your level three, I would say come to Napa. So you use oh. the taste of wine. So this is, this is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. So to find 100% Cabernet Sauvignon under $10 that drinks double, it's like you've struck gold. Can't we charge more? Anyway. Mm. The, the, but this this wine in particular was actually featured last week in Eric's, um, Eric Asimov's Great Wines Under $10. So, yeah. um, so sip, savor, and enjoy all of this. Can I jump in? Because this organic thing and biodynamic and dynamic thing um, has me very intrigued, especially, you know, I've been talking to some people here and we're, Napa is becoming a, a very hot, dry climate. Um, but a lot of the people I talk to, you know, they're producing 200 cases, 1,000 cases. Some of these wineries, they're producing 20, 30, 50,000 cases of $10 Cabernet. That's, if not completely biodynamic, it's organically grown and produced. And it's crazy to think of the quality we can get um, at the price points and the consistency, either A, vintage to vintage, B, just, you know, drinking it over, what was the term? I already lost it. Drinking the wine <laughs> I didn't over. even write it down. Oh, okay. But anyway, you get the point. But I mean, look, they're investing a lot of money into producing great quality, high quality grapes, investing all that time in the vineyards and not throwing that cost back on the consumer. Yeah, let me ask Tina, you said it tastes funky, you like it. When you, I'm swirling air. When you say funky, is it like a little herbaceous? Is it do you get a little stem? Is that the is because sometimes they um, whole crush, and there could be some stem that would give you that. Brooke, do you get that? Are you getting any? Yeah, it it is a little bit more Bordeaux in style. So you That's get true. more of that red fruits, leather. You get a little of that cigar Anything. box. Um, you know, uh, that's what I'm getting. Um, and you get a little bit of smokiness too. Strawberry leather is a great yeah. red fruits and leather. I always say there's two camps of cab, red fruits and leather or dark plums and chocolate. Wow. True. Which do I like? You like, you like both. The one I make the most money on. No, that's not <laughs> true. I do like both. It really depends on the day. So what do you all think of this cab? 
You think it over delivers? If you were to pour this in a glass, what price would you pay? Would you pay $9? Or do you think it drinks double that? I personally think that this drinks in the $20 range. I think it's... I'm stuck at? on if you pour it in a glass. Well, where else would you pour it? In your mouth? I'm, I don't know. I don't know. Let me just... In a cup? What? And, and and what do you eat with this? I mean, Cabernet is easy. Um, a this burger. Thank you, Hillary. Insane for ten dollars less. Yes. This is. I a I'd have this with burger. I'd have this Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is for champagne. But I, any other day, it's great. It's a great go-to pizza. Pizza, sausage pizza, mushroom pizza. It's just a great go-to. Yep, just easy drinking. And I, and thanks Tina. And I think that's what I like about the wines is you you probably could save them for a couple of years, although I, I never do. Um, but at that price point, it, it's got that richness and maybe it's a little stemmy because that's what they do. Um, and that gives you that funkiness so it's not boring. Um, but also it's got good tannin, but they're supple and, and, and it doesn't like dry you out. Yeah, it's not aggressive on the tannins. It's just really nice and easy and mouth pleasing. Shall we head into Syrah? Yes. No sand paper. That's, a, that's very good. I, I love these descriptors. Yeah, I think it's Syrah time. Okay, Syrah, Syrah. Whatever will be, Brooke will mm -hmm. be. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Nothing. Veal, veal, veal. I, Al and Lena, I know where I'm headed at 802. Um, they're, they're great cooks. So Syrah. So Syrah is, yes, it's typically a grape variety that you find in France, but a lot of French people came down to Chile. The Bordeaux, there was a few people in the Rhone. And so Syrah. So Syrah is a great variety that typically you find in the Rhone Valley, but here, because of the soils, it just dominates. So this is a uh, Syrah. There's a little bit of Cabernet in here and just a tiny little bit of Viognier because Viognier and Syrah really love each other. Why are you, really? Why are you, yeah. How much Viognier? There can't be more than a couple points. 3%. That's all you need. It's like frosting, right? It just adds the aromatics. And what Syrah is so great is that it it's, I like to think of it as Cabernet with a lot of spiciness, a lot of like personality. It's got the great texture. It's got the great mouthfeel, but it's also very, very food friendly. So, and Montez is one of the, great iconic estates also. And yes, perfect with barbecue. Oh, yes. Now I, now I want ribs. I, I'm like all these wines, like look how we're, we're talking and discussing all these great like foods that we want to drink with these wines. And yet none of them are Eat. above $20. You want to eat the food, drink the wine. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, well, to me, I pick the wine. I'm keeping first. you honest. That's I'm only on the <laughs> everybody. I'm only on this call to keep Brooke honest. You know, the, it's it. Gary and I like to have a lot of fun. Uh, but, Syrah, at work. but back to the Syrahs, the spicy smokiness, and that's you know for me, that's what I love about Syrahs. I want that a little gamey sometimes. I want that spiciness. I want that smoky, and and ribs would. Farmstead has good ribs. I, that could be a thought for me. You know, I'm just, you know, just now, thinking it well. Oh, thanks. Thanks for rubbing it in. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not even five o'clock yet. <laughs> so let's talk about labeling and truth in labeling when it comes to uh, wine. So if it says Syrah on the label, it actually has to be 75% of that variety. So similar to like uh, California, right, Gary? Yeah. Where, you, where if it's listed on the label, it has to be 75% of that. 
So it can, they can blend in Viognier. They can blend in Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so they're do, why they would blend in other varietals is that they're blending them to create like aromatics. Everybody brings something to the team, correct? Yeah. So only permitted grape varieties that are from the region are permitted. So they can't throw in anything crazy, super crazy. So Legal. wait, let me ask you a question. That that's the the Rhone has very specific rules about Syrah. Same thing in Chile. Do they have rules about what can can and can't go in? Yes, and it changes. I mean, there's so many things that rule-wise have changed recently. I mean, there's so many new regions that are also popping up, but um, they have to uh, be 75% of the stated varietal. There's alcohol requirements. There's all sorts of different things. So, yeah. So, so it's important to, to read the label. It is important to read the label. I'm going to throw out a question out because I've been reading and, and hearing a lot about this. Do you think ingredients should be on a wine label? Mm. That's a, like, it, you know, like what? Like sugar content or? No, but this article, like, more, more went into um, uh, fining with egg white, uh, mega purple. I'm sure you've, you know, this group has heard of mega purple. Uh, which is widely used by some big winemakers and big wineries. Um, uh, there was something else. Um, what gives you acidity? The ask, like if you're adding acidification? Like, yeah. Or capitalization um, or anything? Yeah, that. So, so it's interesting. And, and, you know, as a merchant, I'm like, I'm not sure I need more information, but as a consumer, I think they, I think it would be, I think it would be good. Be what better. do you all think? I mean, the, look, there's the talk of clean wine, natural wine, sustainable, organic, biodynamic. What does it all mean? Um, and for me, I've always leaned towards producers like the ones that we're having tonight that are producing sustainably, organically, biodynamically. Um, the clean, I don't necessarily always agree with. Um, I think if you're producing clean, you're producing organically or sustainably or biodynamically. Um, and that some of these wines that are promoting themselves as being clean, it's another form of marketing. Um, yeah. and, and that's the, just- uh, The natural thing is beyond me. Uh, I, I, I haven't found a natural wine I really like, although they are funky and cool to, to like play with. But I don't sit there and say, oh, give me another glass. It's like, okay, that was nice to taste. But I do prefer my wines to be uh, produced more organically, for sure. So La Pierre. La Pierre is a great producer in the Beaujolais region, one of the top four producers, in, in my opinion. We have several in the store. Um, and he produces, uh, yes, natural, but it's not crazy natural like some people do. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily always smell like kombucha, which some of them can be. Um, and in, as I've grown, um, my palate has changed as we all have. Um, and they, there's a lot of flaws if you get really technical there's flaws to many of those wines. Um, so sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not so great. I guess that goes with everything though, right? Yeah, but I think if you're, um, yes, I, but I, I think some wines, if you're doing um, organic, but not totally um, diving in as deep as possible, you can protect it from, you know, mold or there are issues there that you have to do something or you're going to lose the entire, vein, you know, the season. But there are a lot of great options out there and it's obviously tasting and experimenting is fun. So what do you guys think of the Sarai? Would you drink this regularly? I would. I ain't white you. But I'm just, I'm biased. And Monta South is another great producer. You know, they have a full line and, and I've tasted some great wines from them. 
Uh, yeah. I think Tina's in on this. I think she's a yes for sure. <laughs> she's like, yep. Does uh, anyone have any questions? We're, we're, how, I'm curious as to how many people really enjoy Chilean wines prior to this and maybe have found a few favorites after. Yeah, Ashley, I love this too. Yeah. Well over delivers. Yeah. And Pais, by Pais? the way, Pais. So Pais is, yes, that's what it's known in Chile, but do you know what's known for in California? What it's known as, I should say? The no. mission grape. Oh, really? It's Pais? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yes, and they were making that for the sacrament, for the church. Well, that's AKA. why I didn't know. <laughs> oh, Fun that, facts. That's so cool. There's a couple of people talking about uh, doing some more Charbonneau now. Oh, yeah. Charbonneau, which is kind of cool. So Gary, you want to give um, perhaps some of our listeners some tips on Chile in terms of travel? Places to not miss? It's a long way to go. <laughs> um, but it, but it's it's funny because I've been there twice and in both uh, were the what I call you know like the, um, the 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 death march. We you you literally you 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 get up one day it was two one trip it was two steaks a day. You know because they want to show off their big red wines um, and it, the, but I what I was so impressed with we each time and now when we do some tastings is the diversity of, of styles of wine, uh, whether it's Sauvignon Blancs that we taste, you know, um, and for those of you who don't know a lot of our tastings, we try to do in category. So we may decide that we want to amp up our Chilean white selection for the season. So we'll taste 20 or 30 Chilean Sauvignon Blancs and pick the two or three or four that, that resonate with us. Um, but the diversity of, of styles, uh, I, I think are amazing. I think we're, we're going to start to see more bubbles out of Chile, the same way we're seeing it all around the world. I think people have learned that bubbles are a fun way to spend an entire Sunday, right, bro? Exactly. Uh, well, you just, you think of all the, you think of the coolness in the South. I mean, in across the Andes and Patagonia, they're making incredible sparkling wines. Yeah. And I, I guess the other thought would be that, you know, um, to bring it back home, the cost of a vineyard in, in Northern California is really expensive. And the cost of labor is out of control. Uh, and the cost of housing is out of control. In Chile, the cost of land was significantly less expensive for the people that are currently making wines. And the cost of labor is significantly cheaper. So for those two important uh, cost ingredients, back to accounting, right? If you, if you can reduce your, your fixed costs of the land that you're buying and the labor to produce the product, uh, then you could produce a better product um, for less money. And of course, like we talked about, you don't have any rain, um, but you do have rivers filled and you do have an ability to irrigate. So you're not going to get the mold. You're not going to get the issues that, that could cause trouble in Burgundy in a challenging vintage, or if anybody has ever been to Long Island to taste wines. You know, in some cool, in dry years, it's some really cool wines, but in a normal Long Island season, there's a lot of moisture and humidity, which causes mold. And you don't get that down there. But you gotta get it, you gotta give yourself at least seven or eight days, for sure. Perfect. Thanks. Well, if anyone has any other questions, I will bid ad adieu. No. Adieu. I, I was gonna I was gonna think of something clever and Chilean, but I well, I would say ciao, but that's not that's, that's Italian. That's Italian. Yeah, I know. We have Cesare. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all for joining us. I hope this was informational and educational and enjoyable. Uh, Brooke, thanks for doing all the legwork and making me look good. So, doing all the legwork. Um, well, the wines did the legwork. They did have good legs, but I'm bummed. Uh, thank you all for what? I had one last time. Come on.
Uh, thank, thank you all for joining and, and thanks Brooke and thanks for everybody for staying along for the ride. Fantastic. Cheers. Hasta luego. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm off to eat barbecue. <laughs>